actually, before we start, and whilst we're waiting for the stragglers, I'd like to know a little bit about who I'm talking to, because I think that's a great way to start, because it gives me an idea of who's who. So um, I know we've got some psychotherapy students here, my commiserations, having gone through the whole process myself, uh, something I'll never forget and I'll recover from. Um, so what, what, what do other people do in the room? Hi. Oh, there's Madison. Here. Hello. Come in. How are you doing? Good to see you. So what, what, do, what, is, uh, what do other people in the room, what are, the, what are they doing? What are you doing, sir? You're a psychiatrist. Are you sp special interest in sport? In, in the ECS, I'm a, a physical trainer. Oh, okay, cool. What, what do you do? Uh, I'm a student, but Is I do not study. Uh, Keep well away from it. <laughs> <laughs> My advice. What do you do? Do you mind me asking? Oh, wow. This is going to be right in the middle of the, the fairway for you. Excuse the uh, metaphor of sport. Okay. Anybody else? Acupuncturist. Okay. Great. Are you going in order? No, I'm just doing okay. random. What do you do? I am um, a rebirthing breath work. I've been doing this for 30 years, and it's all about feelings and Okay. Breath. Okay. And I'm in, yeah, emotions. Emotions, yes. Not just men. Well, I don't know what women feel. I'll try to, but usually get it usually get it wrong. <laughs> what do you do? I work with library quite a bit of things, and so I say I do pediatrics, so there's a lot of work in programs. Okay. Just getting into the strap my passing on is in my partner. Okay. Don't go away and say Gary <laughs> said you have to. <laughs> or don't send me the bill if it's you know. <laughs> Anybody else, sir? Back? Okay. Somebody realising in the wrong lecture? <laughs> you think the strap line would give it away, wouldn't you? Yeah. Thanks, Melis. Thank you. Anybody else, sir? Okay. You? Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome, everyone. Welcome. It's, uh, it's lovely to see you all here. Um, lock everybody out. Um, I have to start with an apology. Um, last Wednesday I was playing football with my uh, similar age chaps to me and somebody fired a football straight at me when I was playing in goal and I heroically turned the ball aside for a corner kick and my arm was a bit sore after about three or four days and I thought I better just go to the hospital. I had Sunday and Monday off and um, yeah you can probably guess the rest so I now have a fractured wrist. Um, so apologies, it doesn't look particularly um, attractive against my sartorial elegance. Um, uh, but I was thinking about, I was thinking, come in, hi, come in, say no, don't worry. Um, I was thinking about my emotional connection to what I do, and I was thinking to myself, okay, it's a bloody nuisance having a broken wrist, but would I trade that in for all the fun I have had playing sport over the last 40, 50 years? Who said no? You, you said no. You know exactly what it feels like because although I'm thinking I'm a, look a complete idiot, uh, well that's how I feel inside. We're going back to the emotional landscape. I feel a complete idiot. I'm standing here with a with a red cast on, and hating Man United, it really sort of pains me. There's, there's a red cast on. Um, it just shows that my emotional connection and the thing people say to me, why do you still play football at your age? And the simple answer is, I love it. I laugh for one hour of the week. I'm useless. I can't run anymore. I can kick the ball wide with, open, with the open goal. I miss tackles. I even break my wrist when I try and make a save. But I absolutely love playing football. I have got the best job in the world, by the way. I'm actually a psychotherapist with a football league club. And when the players saw this on Saturday, which was their last league game of the season, they thought I was lying, that I'd broken it playing football, and they claimed it was repetitive strain in injury. You probably guess where this is going, uh, which, of course, I denied this. And then I realized they were probably referring to the amount of notes I take after I see my clients. I'm guessing that's what they thought anyway. But I do have a broken wrist. Okay, so the, the title of the presentation is 
male emotions and sport. Why do some men get emotional about sport but find it harder to access their emotions at work or home? Well, I'm going to um, just start by saying this lecture will be, will have little elements, excuse me, little elements. I'm going to look at the historical aspects of sport, how sport came into existence, how we play sports, what happens biochemically to us. I've got somebody else coming in. Hi, come in. The chemical reactions that go on in our brains when we play sport. This is huge, by the way. Um, by the way, you can stop me at any time and ask me a question or make a comment. That's absolutely fine. If, as a psychotherapist, I could bottle what happens in our brains when we exercise, I would never have to work again. I'd be sitting on a beach sipping pina coladas, smoking a big cigar, because what happens to the brain when we exercise is immeasurable. And it's one of the first things I talk about when I see a new client one of the first things I ask them is how much exercise you're getting. What happens to our bodies? Physiological, when we play sport and watch sport. Psychological, what sport means to us, the meaning of sport for all of us. And finally, the sociological aspects of how we got into this situation and how sport has influenced men. So this is another introductory slide. I've been in both positions. I'm normally down there. I'm a Leeds United fan. This is going to happen to me in the next four weeks. It's the man at the back nodding. He knows what I'm about to go through because Leeds are in the playoffs. Um, I've got another. Hi, come in, come in, come in. One of the most interesting things about that I find um, is that sport encourages catastrophic thinking. Okay? People who don't know the expression, catastrophic, catastrophic thinking is black or white thinking. Well, the truth is, in life, it's a gray scale. Right or, right or wrong, win, lose. There's draw in between, but it's very, very hard. So a lot of men who, and, and women too, who get involved in sport, it's one thing or the other. It's finite. Life isn't finite. Everything can change in the next week or so. We don't know where we're going to be next year, so on and so forth. But in football and sport in general, there's a definitive result. Everything is win, lose, or draw. So there's a very, very black and white, finite, um, binary way of looking at sport. Now let's just look at these images because, well, I'm going to ask you, what strikes you about these three images that we have up on the screen? Tense emotions. But what do, what do these two, how do these two offer? I know there's a very different emotion going on there. But what, what's the thing that really jumps out at you? Jump community. These guys are celebrating together and he's on his own, poor lad. Somebody's laughing there as if to say, have you been there yourself? <laughs> we celebrate together, we lose on our own. And interestingly enough, we can take those celebrations quite easily outside the football stadium. You often see outside a football stadium or a cricket ground or a rugby ground all these celebrations, people jumping up and down, but you're not allowed to take that outside. You will never see anybody crying outside of a football stadium after their team has lost. So strong emotions are allowed inside the ground. The even stronger ones, the despair, probably not allowed outside. So why do people get so attached to their chosen sport or their team? Any questions? Any comments? Well, next thing is I'm going to tell you a little bit about me. What gives me the authority? Is that the wrong word? OK. Can you help me there? Sorry about this. Yeah. Should we do that? Yeah. Thank you. OK, is that better? Thank you, Mavis. Thank you. So, um, so a little about me. What qualifies me to talk to you today? Now, this is interesting. And again, in the photos, one of these two photographs was taken in Tahiti, and the other one was taken in Wigan. Now, can you guess which was which? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, so I'm a sports journalist by profession, and I've been uh, commentating on football for about 30 years. And about 10 years ago, 
I decided to retrain as a psychotherapist, went through a traditional training program. Um, I went from reporting on the touchline uh, of big sporting events to mainly commentating, as you can see I'm commentating there. If you often wonder how commentators know so much about the game, well, all the information is up on the monitor there. Got two monitors. Um, so I trained to be a psychotherapist, and I work for a company called Cognacity, who are based in Harley Street, who specialize in seeing uh, sports clients. We have contracts with specific sports organizations. Um, I also, uh, and I'm doing this job here, present a national radio show on talk sport called On the Sporting Couch, where I run a therapy session on air with a well-known elite sports person. And that is, um, all those episodes are online. If you want to Google them, feel free to look at ACAST on the sporting couch. The best job in the world, though, the best job in the world is I am a psychotherapist for a football club. I am allowed inside that dressing room at five to three when men are hurling insults at each other, trying to G each other up, get the male aggression going. I'd love to tell you the words that the football manager of the team I was working with on Saturday said to his team at five to three before the big match, but I think it would, he dropped the C-bomb basically, and he often does just before, the, um, just before the team are meant to go out. Geeing up those guys to go to a level of expertise, aggression, determination that they probably couldn't do on their own. I've also worked in schools. Uh, as a schools counsellor and therapist, and I spent six years at the men's counselling service in Oxford. So a lot of my work is done with men, dealing with men's issues. So let's go back to how it all began. Now this might be a bit of a jump and a leap, but I'm going to go right back to early societies, hunter-gatherer societies. Um, and these hunter-gatherer societies were very egalitarian. Men and women had the same role able-bodied people were sent out into the uh, wilds to find food. Usually the, um, the old were left to look after the young. Now this is the interesting thing where it connects to sport because these hunter-gatherer groups, normally the size of the group was about 16, 17 people. They all had different roles. And my mind immediately starts to think of teams, team sport. Why do we have the numbers of team sports, or the number of participants in a team sport that we have? Rugby union is 15, football is 11, rugby league is 13. Everybody does a different role in the hunter-gatherer society. It's quite similar in rugby. Everybody has a different role. But we're all interconnected. If you don't do your job, it's all going to go wrong. So everybody has to do their job in a sports team for it to be successful. There was an obvious emotional connection between these people because they, if they did well, they fed each other, they could feed, and the group depended on each other for survival. Was that a hand up for a question or just a stretch? Okay. Both is good. It's fine. Uh, and interestingly, these groups tended to avoid other groups because they would come into conflict with other groups. Very often their women folk were taken away, um, so they tended to be rather isolated. Now, after the Ice Age, there was evidence of some groups finding the land which they then, to, then went on to cultivate. Plenty of food, shelter, materials for building fires, etc. And these fall into small communities. This is the sociological bit of how team, team sports come together. Now, the important thing here is if you've grown your crops and the next valley's crops fail, what are they going to do? Going to come and get your crops, aren't they? So now we go to a male-based society defending the land. The males become much more dominant, females become more child-rearing, looking after the young. And the emotional attachment to the land becomes evident. Now what's this got to do with sport? Well, r stitched into the DNA of sport is the defending of our land, the home game. Okay. And the biggest rivalries that exist in sport today are what we call derby matches when we play the team from the next valley. Psychological studies have shown that the footballers and participants 
playing in a derby match, their testosterone levels raise by about 10% during 10% higher during a derby match than normal. And anybody who's ever been to a Rangers versus Celtic, Man City, Man United, Tottenham versus Arsenal match will know the intensity and fury of what happens when local teams play each other. You're not going to be that worried if from the tribe from Southampton are going to come up if you live in the north of England, but you are going to be worried by the people from the next valley. Does that make sense? And special opprobrium, special hatred, was reserved for people inside your community who were traitors and told the other people, the other set of people, what was going on to attack you. So if I were to say the name Mo Johnson, who became the first Protestant player to play for Celtic Football Club, you can understand the anger and furore that would happen inside that football club. Sol Campbell, who played for both Spurs and Arsenal. Hi, come in, come in, come in, come in. And this is where rivalries of local communities are laid down. Isn't it funny that we think of our football teams, they belong in a certain area. Are we all clear on that? You know, Bath Rugby or Tottenham or Oldham, whoever it is. They are very much part of those communities. Any questions? Good. So the start of competitive sport involved the preparation for training and hunting. This is where the, the Olympic Games begin in 766. But a lot of the early sports laid down in the Olympics were to do with hunting. For example, play fighting, throwing spears, stakes, rocks, wrestling. Prehistoric cave drawings have been found depicting a competitive wrestling, running, swimming, etc. So 766 before the Common Era, human and chariot racing, wrestling, jumping, disc and javelin throwing. Now, interestingly, only men played sport in the Olympic Games. And the really interesting thing here for the women is the men usually competed naked. Well, why did the men compete naked? Because they had to prove they were not women. There was no women participating in these events. Great today, wouldn't it? Imagine the naked Olympics. <laughs> bring a whole new dimension to t TV coverage. <laughs> Anybody not interested in some, yeah, well, no, no. Um, the, just uh, thinking more to the, towards the right of this uh, caption, team sports seem to be developed in the public schools of Britain a bit later on, um, and then spread to the British Empire, t uh, uh, um, sports like cricket, rugby, football, bowling, cue sports like uh, billiard snooker and pool hockey. So this is where we get competitive sport from. But interestingly how it's often attached to hunting. All modern forms of football, and I'm just going to talk about football here, um, have their roots in folk football. Do many of you know this? That the, um, these, these, they used to have these uh, competitive matches that would involve the whole village where they'd play another village and there'd be like 300 aside and the goal would be in one village, one goal would be in one village, and another goal would be in another village, and this would take all day, of course. So you'd have chaotic pastime, pastime played by mobs on a, a public holiday. Looks, looks like a Tottenham Arsenal game, doesn't it? Um, it was a bit of a free-for-all, there was no rules. Hi, come in, come in, come in. There was no, there was no rules, it was a free-for-all, it was extremely violent, involving kicking, handling of a ball, um, played by large groups of men usually. The object of the ac exercise was to drive this ball from one end of land to another. And folk football was essentially rural, played in rural communities, and um, the, the matches tended to coincide with country fairs. And the change was brought about, this changes now with industrialization. Because as you know yourself, if you know anything about the Industrial Revolution, there is a movement of people off the land and into the towns and factories where there is mass uh, employment. So this is from 1850 onwards. Isn't this great? The Rudge Whitworth Britain's Best Bicycle. I think it would be done under trading standards today, whether they were the best bicycle in the whole of the country. But interesting that even going back here in the late 1800s, we're getting the first concept of sponsorship whereby a, um, a factory, I'm guessing this was the best bicycle factory, by the way, though there's no bicycles in the back. What are you doing there? 
trying to keep in shot. Um, football teams evolved between factory workers, and for the first time there was leisure at weekends. I don't know if you know, but most factories closed at Saturday lunchtime. Uh, Sundays was kind of reserved for church, and therefore you had this period of leisure on Saturday afternoon. That's where you get your traditional Saturday three o'clock kickoffs from. At the same time, we have development of travel, so teams could now go from point A to point B on the railways, play away games. Same with fans, they could get to away games in a very simplistic way. So the first leagues are being created around the end of the um, 1800s. And you also have the start of newspapers, and they're beginning to report what's going on in these matches. Larger and larger stadium were built. You often get one designer, actually, uh, building the same stadium, type of stadium, so Glasgow Rangers ground and Aston Villa's ground and Everton's Goodison Park all built by the same designer, that's where they look identical. Um, and whilst the male game dominated, the women's game was also on the rise until 1914, the break uh, with the, when First World War broke out. Women's teams. Interestingly enough, I'm going to the Women's World Cup this summer. Uh, and it's interesting how that has absolutely grown and grown in France, of course, happening in, I'm going to Le Havre for three weeks to cover football. And um, many men now weigh at war. Women began working in factories and began to play informal games of football during their lunch breaks. And workers come to see these games. Uh, and although the war ended, the First World War ended in 1918, there are still large groups of people coming to see these matches. And by 1920, there were about 150 uh, women's football teams happening. There's still more in Scotland and Wales. That year, 53,000 people went in, got into Goodison Park to watch a ladies' football international. I'm always stuck between ladies' football and women's football. It should be women's football, really, but they call it ladies' football then. Um, men wanted a sense of continuity during the war, the people who were not away fighting, so they came to see these matches. Now, I'm going to just go slightly sideways here, but the idea of the desire to follow a football team, I think, is inside a lot of people, even when you're displaced. And there was obviously a displacement during the war. I went to see a friend of mine recently who's moved to Bologna. Big, big Portsmouth fan. Uh, supported Portsmouth all his life. And he moves with his partner to Bologna, to a small uh, village called Ferrara. And he suddenly decides he is bereft of his football and supporting Portsmouth. And he decides now to support a football team called Spal, who are now in Serie A in Italy. And he combines the love of Portsmouth with his love of Spal, the idea that even though he's physically removed from supporting Portsmouth, he needs this attachment to another local team. And he and his partner go watch Spal every week play in Serie A. I think they're just about to avoid relegation, but I might have got that wrong. They were struggling last time I saw. So I'm going to pull the two uh, wars together, and we're going to break away from football a little, and how the world wars change society. And it's, this goes kind of comes on to what, what happens to masculinity after the wars. Because the wars change society. Uh, after the First World War, a million people, uh, British servicemen, are killed. Uh, many come back disabled. And when the men return from both wars, they have a sense, many men had a sense of resentment towards the country for taking away a life they once had. I'll tell a story of my former father-in-law. And he was a very aspiring academic. He, was a, he came from a very humble background. But he was ready to go to university. He had passed all his exams. War breaks out. And he never gets that chance again. And the thing that stayed with him the whole of his life was that the war had taken away the possibilities that he had. And men often came back with resentment towards their women folk for managing just a little bit too well without them and not in having had to go through the same horrors that they had gone through. They'd been scarred psychologically. A lot of these young men were only 17, 18 years old, and although you, had to conscript, you could conscript at 18, many went there underage. Bear in mind that the adult brain does not finish its wiring process till the age of 24 in women 
and 26 in men, you can begin to understand what war did to men. They are literally still children psychologically. And having restrained their emotions to such a degree, whilst these men are away, they saw terrible, um, terrible events. It meant their involvement when their families, when they came back from war, with their children was minimal. This is a really defining piece of um, sociological change. And this is another lecture indeed, which I, I, I won't do now, but there is, we can, this is the, the growth of the fatherless society. Huge swathes of men right across Europe have been killed. Hi. Huge swathes of men across Europe have been killed. There's a shortage of men. And during warfare, men soon learned how to rest restrain their natural emotions, partly to avoid being judged and keep them together because they've been shattered emotionally. So these uh, control mechanisms help men survive. These are some basic rules of masculinity. Real men don't cry, because if you're a cry, you're a cry baby. Cry baby. This is a, a, this is a real a regular phrase that I was brought up with. Don't be a cry baby. Real men don't cry. Because crying's for children. Real men don't express emotion openly because this can lead to punishment, anger, and frustration, and hopelessness. Imagine if you're showing your emotion when you're away at war, what it's going to do to you. Are you going to be an effective soldier? Feeling empathy for those on the battlefield for you was not particularly helpful. For those c killed or wounded would only highlight your own plight. What the bloody hell am I doing here? Attack is the best mean of de defense, strength and retaliation. I mean, I'm sure many of you know about today's warfare that there are many armies in the world who have the message, if you rain on us, we'll storm on you. And the message is quite simple. Don't start a fight you can't finish. That fear of retaliation. Does that make sense? I know a particular army in the world whose motto is that. You rain on us, we'll storm on you. And that is in the dressing rooms of football clubs and rugby clubs and cricket clubs today. So. Men portraying a facade of strength is important, especially as an officer to instill confidence in men. I'm going to put up this front. This is all going to be a psychological front. And none of these feelings are to be found in women. Don't be a girl. Women have the ability to uh, show their emotions. So letting any feelings sneak through this tough exterior would betray the very essence of your masculinity. So sporting fixtures now become the only safe context to show these emotions. And a chance of a bonding opportunity for men returning from war to now bond with their sons. Because they found it very hard to bond with their sons afterwards. Any questions? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, All right. <laughs> Whoops. Thank you. So let's, um, let's look at where macho came from. Macho came from 1950s uh, Mexican cinema. Machismo is Hispanic for masculine or vigorous. They look quite a bunch, don't they? So this is the birth of the macho attitude. And this, <laughs> this is the birth of the macho attitude. Well, that's clever, isn't it? Ooh. How did I do that? Um, where rules of masculinity are laid down post-war. This is how the sort of attitudes that are coming back from the First and Second World War with ordinary men conscripted and being replanted back into normal society. And having had a military culture imposed on them, they have no idea how to emotionally engage again with their families. Uh, and they begin to brutalize the kids they come back to. Basically, if it was good enough for me, it's good enough for you. If I was dealt with this way for the past three years, I'm going to deal with you like that. And macho stereotypes become glamorized in the Hollywood cinema. So um, figures like James Cagney, Humphrey Bogart, and John Wayne. Have everybody heard of those? 
become these macho figures that we look up to. And there was a glorification of war. We get a whole spate of po uh, war films which glamorize these devil may care attitude of these guys. But macho men are accused of being controlling. They're dominating their women folk, they're dominating society. And just jumping slightly sideways here, Freud talked about the compulsion to repeat. So many of these men returning from the war simply repeat, repeated the behaviors that had been visited on them. Does that make sense? They tried to live up to their macho stereotype and very often were isolated from their families as they become to, began to brutalize their own kids. We could do a whole section on father's relationship to their daughters compared to father's relationships with their sons and something that we would call unconscious envy about a son who doesn't have to go to war, especially after the Second World War, compared with a dad who had to go to war. You often find that even today, that you get a lot of unconscious envy with fathers with sons. They end up bullying them. And what you find is uh, sons of macho men just don't have the emotional bandwidth to navigate their way through the emotions which are quite difficult. So how this actually, in my opinion, and it's only my opinion, plays out is this hooliganism in football in the 1960s and 70s. These young children grow up in a post-war period uh, where young men were facing high rates of unemployment, reduced opportunities, sport them, gave them a sense of belonging, and a relatively cheap way of getting rid of their frustrations. Did anybody live through this period? I know I certainly did. It was bloody frightening, wasn't it? Going to football was very, very frightening at times. I remember being chased by a whole number of different sets of football fans from different clubs outside the ground where I, I was at. And you know, if I said to my dad, why can't mum come to the football? He'd say, well, it's not safe. So they end up more masculine-based crowds than ever before. Many football clubs, as you've probably heard now, historical cases of child sex abuse were not looking after their players. And I have worked with players who've told me that the initiation ceremonies of young men joining football clubs were just as brutal. And we're talking about young men being placed inside huge industrial tumble dryers and being told to strip naked. There's all sorts of sexualization, initiation ceremonies. It was not a great place. And I'm sure you're aware, what he said, historical child sex abuse was happening in our football clubs at that time. I worked with a guy called Keith Gillespie. I can mention his name because he was one of the guests on the radio show. He talks about this at his time at Manchester United. Keith Gillespie lost seven million pounds in gambling debts. Extraordinary. And at a time when his football club should be supporting him, his football manager at the time, Sir Alex Ferguson, was giving Keith money and asking him to put a bet on for him. Extraordinary, isn't it? As violence increased, the presence of women in the crowds inevitably diminished. So the, uh, the next slide, as I'm sure you recognize, is the three big disasters in football stadiums uh, in the 1980s. I've got a personal story about all of these, actually, which, is, which I, I think my partner Sue knows about. But believe it or not, my first job in local radio was to go into that stand there at Bradford City and pick up a tape from the commentator who was commentating on the match and physically take it back to BBC Radio Leeds where I was working um, because there was no modern communication systems as they have today. And I remember picking up the tape and going to the back of this stand here and I couldn't get out. This is halfway through the second half. And I'm thinking, how the hell do I get out of this football stadium? And what had happened is the doors had been locked from the other side to stop people coming in, because they didn't want young kids coming in or whoever coming in for free in the second half. And I had to find a steward, and it took me around about 10 minutes to find a steward to physically let me out of this ground. So when this fire breaks out, this is a wooden stand, by the way. There was rubbish that they'd never cleared underneath the stand. Somebody dropped a match. The whole thing goes up like a tinderbox. And when I saw that, I thought, there but for the grace of God, because I used to spend virtually every Saturday afternoon at Bradford City Valley Parade. 
This here is the, um, well, I'll go to, to, to Heisel next, where Liverpool fans charged into a section of Juventus fans. 39 Juventus fans died that day uh, in the Heisel Stadium. I was working for a radio station in Liverpool at the time, Radio City. And my boss said you can either go to Heisel or go to Rotterdam because Everton were playing in one final, Liverpool playing for another, and I chose Everton. I don't know why I did that. But thankfully, I missed the Heisel Stadium disaster, and I was producing a radio show that night in Liverpool. And this here is, you probably recognize, this is Hillsborough in 1989, 88, where, um, where 96 football fans lost their lives. A year later, sorry, a year before, I was in this stadium exactly at this match, an FA Cup semi-final, Leeds were playing Coventry in 87. And I was in the main stand with my dad and I saw exactly the same thing happening as happened a year later with tragic consequences. And I said to my dad, Dad, that just doesn't look right. All the Leeds fans that day were in this end, these are Liverpool fans. All the Leeds fans were desperate to get out the Leppings Lane because they were being crushed. Our football grounds were not fit for purpose. You add hooliganism into that, and this is what you get. The major outcome was for football clubs to go all-seater. I'll explain why that happens. Suppose Sheffield Wednesday's ground at Hillsborough had a capacity of about 70, 60,000. Well, the government insisted these football grounds become all-seater, and the capacity then reduces to about 30, 28,000. Commercially, that doesn't make any sense. You've lost half your income. So a lot of football clubs decide then to move, like Arsenal is a good example. Tottenham has just, just moved, of course. Many of the big clubs say this is uneconomic. It's not going to happen. Um, but football was in danger of being closed down because the, the stadium were not fit for purpose. And what you have here is you have new or seater stadium and you have the rise of the middle class fan. So let's go on to the more psychotherapeutic element of why. I'm sorry about the cold, by the way. It is cold in here. I'm sorry. Yeah, please do. Is it really cold there? Thank you. Do you mind if I continue? Is that all right? OK. So where do we get these? We've, we've looked at the sociological and historical aspects of how sport came about. But how do we get meaning playing? and supporting different, different clubs. Well, people get meaning by identifying with another group of people. It defines part of what we are used to. We all have a sense of our own community, our own religion, where we come from, which socioeconomic group we, we belong to. We tend to feel great comfort by belonging, belonging to our families. Um, this again jumps sideways again, but I have a whole theory about why... Te Do you want to move into the centre? Because I can see you getting cold. I don't want you to suffer from hypothermia. It's probably going to be much warmer down... There's a, there's a seat down here. We've, we've gone to sort out the, the, uh, the, the new Ice Age. We were talking about the Ice Age before. Um, so when I'm working with young boys, I do a lot of work with adolescent boys. If they come from dysfunctional families and they have what one headmaster called DDD, Dad Deficiency Disorder, they will often find great comfort attaching to their football club because their male role models quite simply do for them what a member of the family should be doing. They identify with a success. And when Man United win and you're a Man United fan, Man United are doing it for you. Those boys actually believe. And that's why they have this adoration of footballers or rugby players or cricketers, because they believe those people are actually doing it for them. There was an experiment done in the 1970s called the Minimal Group Paradigm trying to figure out why we attach to groups um, and what were the minimal conditions to attach to a particular group. And what they found out is if I were to split this room in two, 
and I were to put one set of people in yellow and the other set of people in red and you had all this clothing, the yellows would look to each other and find things in each other that you actually recognized in yourself and you would look at the other group and reject them as not having the same values as you even though you're just wearing different, different colors. Even though you had nothing to do with each other, you had nothing in common, you came from no common background. We like to connect with groups. That's part of our human nature. Football and rugby and cricket enhances the idea of group identification. Now, I didn't know this until about last, last year, but I'm going to tell you, let you into a secret. Every <coughs> professional sports club has a split in the dressing room. I didn't know this. Because the group is, tends to be so big. If you look at a football club, you'll have maybe a first team squad of 20 people. The squad is always too big inside a football club to hold together. So they will inevitably split between them A versus B, yellows versus reds. In the football club I work in, it's old versus young. And the old players are hugely critical of the young players with phrases like, they've never had it so good, we never, you know, when we were training, we were training on, training on terrible football pitches. And the thing that really wound them up this year, and a piece of work I had to do inside the club, was when the young kids, when the team lost, the young elements of the team went on social media and bragged. Bad, bad, I played well today, but we lost 4-0. The oldies absolutely hated it. How are we doing? Thank you. I'm sorry about that. We were just talking about how we identify with clubs um, and how if we split a, split a group in two, you'll identify automatically with anybody in your group and automatically hate or dis find displeasure in another group. And football, as I was just saying, really enhances this idea of group identification. Any dressing room I've ever worked in has a split. Old versus young in my club. But I know in some premiership clubs, the most obvious split is foreign versus UK. That happens a lot. Spain, at a World Cup in 2006, had Catalan against non-Catalan. So the actual splits that kept Spain apart during the, the, the uh, Spanish Civil War still existed. And then, until Spain won the World Cup in, I can't remember which year they won it, 2010, there was a theory that Spain could never win a World Cup because that split always existed. Because their two biggest teams are Real Madrid and Barcelona, and you always had a, a preponderance of players from those two teams, and they automatically, therefore, saw each other with great suspicion. On to the psychotherapeutic um, elements of what happens when you support a team. Well, we all have mirror neurons. I'm guessing that many people who study psychology or psychotherapy know that we have mirror neurons. If you don't believe me, one of the great experiments, if you've got, um, if you know somebody who's got a small baby and a mum is trying to feed a small baby, watch what happens when a mum tries to put the spoon, I can't do this very well with my wrist at the moment, tries to put the, sp uh, um, the spoon into the baby's mouth. Look what happens to the mother's mouth she will open it. Because the baby has from birth mirror neurons and the baby also mirrors the mother's behavior. So mirror neurons are there inside our brains whether we like it or not and these, we, this helps us to identify being in somebody else's shoes. When we see our football club excitedly celebrating we're part of it too. Yes, you had your hand up. Okay. And they did this incredible work on just if you go like this to a to an infant, part of the brain that is associated with their hand lights up. Exactly. So the, the mirror neurons are so sensitive and, and when they're they're dull, if you you know, touch different parts of your body, they 
If you want to get, yes, thank you. That's, I, I really would recommend anybody who wants to know a little bit more about how our brains are affected by, about the mirror neurons and our relationship with our main caregiver, usually our mum, read a book called Why Love Matters. It's an absolute brilliant book about how mother's love for their kids switches on bits of the brain for the, and, and helps development. And if that love isn't given and the holding and the, the gurgling and, and so on and so forth by the mum, the mother as we call it, goo goo ga 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 ga, that is helping the child's development the whole time. And when our teams are winning and playing well, it affects our overall mood. We start releasing the neurotransmitter dopamine, um, which is directly involved in regulating our brain's reward system. Conversely, when your team loses, your brain produces cortisol, a stress hormone. I know what that feels like when my team lose. I feel depressed. Um, I have a decrease in serotonin. I have increased anger, and that's why you have fighting inside grounds. It's absolutely chemical. Your body reacts to the brain. Studies have shown that sports fans can feel intense anxiety before a big match, just watching it, never mind playing it. If you're playing it, you've probably heard of players being physically ill and retching before a big game. So that's the concept of how, this, um, how these chemicals affect you. This includes both cognitive anxiety, realizing you're in a big game, and also somatic anxiety this feeling of butterflies in the stomach because blood is being taken away from your tummy and into other areas of your body where, which are needed for the flight, 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 fight response. And when our teams win, our hearts beat faster, blood pressure goes up, blood gets diverted around our bodies, and spectators of football saw, uh, whose team were winning saw significantly increased heart rates. But there's nothing more anxiety provoking than your team are one goal up in a big, big match and they're defending for all they're worth. Your heart starts going as well. Um, and this is often associated with vigorous exercise. I love this next one. I love this next slide. Absolutely. The way our brains work means men need an outlet for their natural aggression. To fight, desire to fight, driven by testosterone. Because it's interesting that there is two, I think, two strong psychological components going on here. There's the aggression of the man in the baseball cap, but somebody quite literally bearing his chest in an expression of male machismo and sexuality. And sport allows this outlet to be safely addressed. It's a great image, isn't it? The reduction of P... Sorry, uh, that's not me, by the way. <laughs> I think, well, I know it's not particularly attractive. Well, not, for, I don't know what his wife thinks, I never met her. Uh, but I think it is, the idea of bearing your chest is aggressive, but also it could be seen as a very sexual act as well. The idea of, I am big, I'm male, and I'm, I'm the biggest guy in town, and I'm leader of the pack, and therefore I'm the sexually most dominant one. I'm fearless, yeah, really good, I'm fearless. And interestingly, you know, if, when you go, when you, we dig down into sexuality, that, you know, what, you know, why are women sometimes attracted to the bad boys? Well, he's a bad boy. I know it's not a particularly attractive chat, but this idea of raw masculinity is very, very attractive in terms of re reproduction and so on and so forth. Sport allows these emotions to be safely addressed, and the reduction of PE time in our schools and the disappearing of our uh, playing fields it means boys no longer have as much opportunity to vent their natural emotions. Now, technology and computer games, I think, has made this a lot worse. Because what boys are doing now, especially boys, are playing for long periods of time on computer games, which are very violent, very aggressive. And normally, in the past, violent, aggressive games, wrestling, would come with a physical action, which would burn off some of this aggression. And what you're finding now is boys are now stuck in their bedrooms playing violent video games and have got nowhere for this aggression to go. Um, and the anger that defeating these games creates has no physical outlet. I was working in a school and a little boy put his hand up and he said, Gary, I, I want you to tell me. He says, I love, my, I love my PlayStation, but I got so angry I threw the thing out the window. I felt so sorry for him. 
because when I was a young lad and I wanted to get rid of my frustrations when I was growing up and all my male testosterone was kicking in, I used to go for a run, play football, play sport, and it would burn off some of those hormones. What a great image. I'm going to give you the best image. This is my supervisor pointed this out. I wonder what's going on here. Any ideas? Bottom right is, I don't know if you know, this is the 2018 World Cup. England score a goal, thousands of people watching the sport, and they all throw their beer in the air. This is all beer going up. F1 on the podium. What's going on? We're all adults here. We can all have com a grown-up conversation. Golden shower. Golden shower. <laughs> uh, yeah. Any ideas? I mean, there, uh, there's no research. This is just you know me as a sports psychologist I'm, and and my supervisor. Any ideas? There's an ecstasy. Well, I think this is an orgasmic ecstasy. This, this is an ejaculatory, I said that right? Ejaculatory um, pose. That interesting that men bring the champagne corks down to their waist and spray each other. And then there is the other one, which, which, which looks like a gun. Like a gun? Yeah. The, the one that is on the R right. Yeah. And look at, his, look at his pose. It really is sort of highly... There's a gun, there's aggression, but there's also a sexual energy around that. And I think the same when everybody's throwing their beer up. In. So how male celebratoriness around sport has a sexualized element as well. Now, you might disagree with me, but I mean, my supervisor pointed this out. I think he's right. How do women celebrate when in sport? Any ideas? Say again? You threw your beer as well. Hugging. Come and see me for therapy later. Yeah. <laughs> hugging, exactly. Women celebrate by hugging and kissing. They don't do that. Except the young woman there threw a beer in the air. Yeah, you had your hand up. Are you just cold? <laughs> yeah, the, the Arctic conditions are, are coming down. Well, my belief is that when we don't have an outlet for these physical, strong physical feelings, suppressing the natural instinct of male aggression. Why don't you think that it's coming from the There's another, there's, yeah, come and sit next to Sue here. The system's downstairs, apparently. If you want to come and change, there's a chat, there's a, there's a yeah. So suppressing the natural instincts of male aggression created through testosterone with less physical activity, in my opinion, creates anxiety, depression, addictive behaviors. That's why we're here today to talk about addictive behaviors, relationship breakdowns, and suicide ideation. I think today's men are struggling to find safe and acceptable outlets for their aggression Sport is one, obviously, but when they can't find that, they often revert to passive aggressive behavior, which I think is stitched in th right through the DNA of today's society with masculinity. How to control other people through passive aggressive behavior. And I find that really hard in a lot of the counseling work I do. Because men don't realize that that passive aggressive controlling behavior ultimately strangles a relationship. Today's men are much more subtle in their control, but it's there. I'm trying to think of a piece of client work I've done where, okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about TA, transactional analysis. Nod your head if you know about TA. Yeah. So if you know in the TA model, you have three ego states. You have critical parent, adult, child. And if you put those two on either side of each other, I really should have done a slide on this, I often find with men that they go into critical parent with their partners and turn their female partners into children. And then he come to me and say, we're married for 10 years, there's no sex in the marriage. And he said, what's, you know, why, why can't my wife just get on with it? What's, what's going wrong? And we, we, we start to un, un, undo and unstitch some of their behaviors, their critical parents. And eventually I turn around to them and say, 
and say to them, if you're a critical parent, you're relating to your partner as a child, that desexualizes a long-term relationship because nobody wants to sleep with a parent. And when I say that to them, often the, the penny drops. And if anything I've ever, ever, ever said to a client, the TA model is the most powerful, I would say, historically that's ever worked for me. Does anybody want, someone, want me to go through the TA model again? Yeah. TA model, transactional analysis. There's three ego states. Imagine we'd one, two, three. Top one would be critical parent. The next one would be adult to adult, the adult. The next would be the child. Put these two together. Normally, we are, you and I are now having an adult to adult relationship. We're having a conversation. If I tell you off for being late, and where were you? I jump into critical parent and turn you into feeling a child. And in a long term relationship, that is curtains. Anybody, anybody else any questions around TA? Okay. So again? Rebellious child, but then you, you have passive aggressive child. But again, it erodes a, road, a, a relationship. Um, I think this is especially true, this passive aggressive behavior by, with today's sportsmen, because they're reflecting an image of themselves out into the world, which they're then having to control. The best metaphor I can use of this is suppose we are, be, we are interacting with the world. And our interaction with the world creates an image of who we are. Imagine that image is a, is a mirror that we're looking back at. This is how the world sees us. I'm really worried about what you're thinking about me, so I'm going to change your thinking around what you think about me. And it's the same, the best metaphor I can use is, imagine having a bit of chocolate from, do you see the strawberry and chocolate fountain, by the way? Mm -hmm. Imagine having a piece of chocolate on the side of your face, and you're trying to control that by rubbing it on the mirror, trying to get rid of it that way. You can't deal with the image, you have to deal with yourself. And that's why therapy works. And too many people who have the ego, who are looking at the image of themselves constantly and trying to change that image, and worrying what you're thinking about me, and worrying what you're thinking about me, you, the only way you can change that is by changing yourself, by wiping the chocolate off your own face. That takes work. Does that, does that make sense? We're nearly at the end, everybody, and then we're going to have some questions. Come on. There we go. So passionately supporting a sports team, I think, is great for men's health. Look at that fantastic young man there, enjoying himself. I believe sport can teach us many life lessons, like fairness, resilience to adversity. It stirs up loyalties, stirs up passions and it can create unfathomable loyalties in, the, in our football team. And if you don't believe me, just ask me afterwards, because it's the, the things I have gone through, and the hardships and the psychological damage I have given myself supporting my football team, I'll probably write a book about one day. Um, most men will change everything in their lives. They'll change wives, they'll change professions, they'll change just about everything. They will very, very rarely change the football team they support. Why? Why? It's a loyalty that is just too far for them. It is part of their tribe. It's part of their, the valley where they were brought up. They're fed by the team. My connection with where I was brought up in Leeds is the only connection I have with that place. It is my valley. It's where I belong. Oh, not by the football, no. Unless you're a Man United fan, of course. <laughs> and and that's, that's, the, um, that's the lecture. If you want to follow me, I'm on, there's my Twitter handle. But this is a time for you to ask questions about anything you've heard today, or ask me about my work, or what I think about psychotherapy in sport, or anything at all. This is your, this is your chance. Yeah. Yeah. So what does that say about me or any other man that can't, that isn't really committed? Well, if I were working with you and you came, that, that was your first opening gambit with me as a client, there would be cogs going on in my head, things, okay, he can't emotionally commit to the football team. 
I wonder what else he can or can't emotionally commit to. It becomes a model, a paradigm of something else. And I don't want to go into your own personal circumstances. Oh, there we go. That's, that's a really interesting thing. That, yeah, the best people always are. But the point is, isn't it? In, I mean, I've never met you before, sir. But the point is, isn't it interesting that that model is already there in, in your... And, and interestingly, you know, I, I'm the same as you to some degree. I mean, I love, I love my football team. But we win. When we win, we win. But they lose. I don't ever say we lose. Can you see how I'm autom automatically I, I, I distance myself from the pain of losing? They bloody lost today. We've won. Same team. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so my my unconscious is now my unconscious is now thinking, there is a young woman, who has a partner who will watch any football match on the television, and what the, the things that will be going on in my mind, I think it's a very easy way for men to opt out of difficult conversations, for their brains to go into neutral. They recognise these patterns. They recognise it's a very safe thing to do and they're not emotionally attached to the game that they're watching, I think it's a bigger question about emotional attachment. It's a very easy thing to do to watch a football match that means nothing. But you know, you know Sky Sports made a fortune out of that, <laughs> out of playing, you know, watching, watching football. I think as somebody who watches quite a bit of football, I think just an easy way uh, to me, I would rather watch a match that is just movement of people around the pitch or a rugby game or a cricket game. I don't have to concentrate on it Whereas, say, like a drama or something like that, or a police drama, I would have to concentrate on to keep up with the narrative. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm really interested in your confusion. Uh, the way you say, yes, these are all the benefits of being sport, you know, mm -hmm. being interested in sport. So we're, uh, we're talking about the uh, staying faithful, well, you know, just uh, being engaged. So all kind of things, but it, what I'm interested in is that this is only applicable inside of the one group you choose. But and I think that the, the one group you choose is one thing, but then when you go in the world, uh, well, I'm interested in the win-win situation too, you know, and, and that's what we see it's more win-lose in sport. But I, I'm just interested because uh, it seems like when you're speaking like if the, you assume the aggression is part of the human being, right? For me, especially for men. Yeah, and my understanding is that aggression would come from a lot of frustration from the needs not being met and from feelings that arise from it and it builds a pressure cooker and, you know? And but, but I would, sorry to jump in, but I would argue that sport is a safe, safe haven for that. And just jumping back in your question, I think we can support different groups. I can support Leeds and England. I can support Manchester United and England, or I can support PSG in France. It's fine. So we can have different levels of support. I can be an England cricket fan as well as a football fan, and I can want England Rugby Union to win the World Cup. So we can have different loyalties that bolt into our personal story. And, for example, I have a friend who is passionately... Um, an Irish, he's a Manchester United fan, but he's an Irish rugby fan because his family are all from Ireland. So we can have different tribal allegiances. I'm, I'm interested in the, in the spirit of war that it can create. But, you know. and, and it's there, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Dads to help them break this, I think, highly 
I think um, that's, a, that's a great question, by the way. I think my work in football clubs really brings that to the fore, that you have players in there who are exactly what you say. I also work with the academy, which is the young boys all the way up from 9 to 18. And the parents, you know, I say to the, the people who run the academy, what's your biggest problem running the academy of this football club? They all say the same thing, parents. They're not bothered about the kids, because if you say to the kids, go tackle that brick wall, they'll do it. But the arguments that ensue, the coaching that goes on from the sidelines, the rows in the back of the car on the way back from the game, you should have done this, you should have done that, it is absolutely toxic. And one of my lectures, I do a lecture like this to the football academies, is to parents, and I say, let your kids be kids. Because this is just one part of their lives that parents live vicariously to their children. Sorry about that. Yeah. And also teach their sons how to be safe on a battlefield and so on yes, and so forth. I think you're right. I mean, we've. I mean, mine, mine is a generation that's lived through a warless period of our lives, probably for the first time ever. So I, I take your point entirely that we've not lived. I've not lived through a major world world war. But if you think about the repercussions of those two wars on masculinity and dad deficiency disorder, or the absence of a uh, absence of a proper male society, who have not been brutalised by war. I'm pretty glad that you know maybe in generations and generations and generations, hopefully we'll live without a war. But maybe there is a hope that we can teach men to have, be emotionally literate. It's not about feminizing men. It's not about teaching men not to have real emotions. It's about staying in the adult, because a lot of men are unable to actually enter conflict. That the biggest thing I ever teach men when I work with men is how to, without aggression without violence enter conflict. So I can stand up to you and say, I'm really sorry, but that ain't gonna wash. And that's the work I do, and that's why sportsmen often come to me and say, I like working with you, because I won't put up with nonsense. But I do it without any aggression, no violence, but I enter conflict. And I'm prepared to enter conflict with just about anybody in a, in a positive way. And here's an interesting one. My therapist, and I, uh, my, my supervisor and I were talking about my work in the football club. And I say, you know what, sometimes I'm completely lost. They get beaten 3-0. I go home at the weekend, I'm upset. And he says, Gary, you speak truth to power. And that is the most powerful thing you can ever do. When there is a megalomaniac in charge of your football club, when somebody is, a, you know, is, is, has got all the power in the world, because football clubs are very linear in how they, how they operate and the power structures, when you are allowed to speak truth to power, in my opinion, you're doing your job as a therapist. Even if you think those words are never taken on board. And the funny thing is, and Sue will, will back me up on this, I speak to the football manager at my club and they'll go, no, nope, you're wrong. No, 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 you're wrong. Ah, no, wrong. I said, this is going to happen. No, nope, no, nope, you're wrong. A week later, he'll do exactly as I said. He'll never come back to me and say, oh, by the way, Gary, you're right. He'll just do it. <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah. DDD, yeah. DDD, and um, some of these other things that, that contribute towards men um, releasing aggression or controlling hmm. or aggressive manner. What do you suggest to your clients, patients? It depends who it is. Did everybody hear that question? DDD, um, DDD is Dad Deficiency Disorder. And what we've found in today's society, with especially um, many, many children growing up without recognized fathers in their homes, young men don't have good role models. Um, and that is a really difficult thing for young men to cope with. I teach these men, young men, to be emotionally literate. And what I mean by that is being able to say to somebody, 
I'm struggling. I'm having a hard day. Um, this is not great. And that's the hardest thing for young men to do because therapy has basically three basic constructs. One, you recognize as a problem. Two, you understand that by talking to somebody it will help. And three, be brave enough to do it. But the first thing is you have to recognize there is a problem. And without recognition there's a problem, therapy ain't going nowhere. So I, I often get a, a parent or a spouse ring me and say, will you see my husband? Will you see my child? Will he, see, will, he, will, he, will he come do some therapy? And I say to that person, no, I'll talk to you. But the person who really has to ring me is the person who recognizes there is a problem. Any other questions? Yeah. I think this kind of tribal instinct of like forming a band and, mm. and having, you know, like dedication to a particular band is my partner works with these things. It's just it's yeah, the parallels are pretty interesting. But my question would be so I work with sixteen to eighteen year olds in a kind of student support setting. Mm -hmm. um, Very simple answer. It's a very complex question, but I'll try to give a short answer. First of all, I don't think the online communities of young men talking to each other is necessarily a bad thing. They're talking and making little groups amongst themselves and playing these games amongst each other. I think that's okay. I think it's the addictive nature of those games um, and the amount of screen time that we are allowing our young people um, on there. That, to me, is the biggest, biggest problem. So as long as there's boundaried screen time, I think it's a good thing. As long as it's part of a big and healthier lifestyle of eating and going out there and running around with their mates. I mean, Sue's, Sue's youngest, you know, youngest is, is got loads of mates and he's running here and running around. It's fantastic. So the screen time is, is fine as long as it's part of something bigger. The bit that really upsets me, and I, I didn't know this again until the last year, is that people who are designing these games are recruiting people from the betting industries to design these games. So that this desire to buy credits and buy this and buy that and buy the other is stitched into the DNA of these computer games, which will mean that those people have possibly have the model for an addictive behavior when they get to 18 and 19 and they're growing out of these games, but then they're going into gambling. And I didn't realize this until the last year until I actually met somebody who was part of a, an organization who was creating these computer games. Betting companies are using people to create those games. It's poorly, isn't it? Yeah. I love the question because I believe <coughs> organizations should have people like me as part of their workforce. Somebody who comes in maybe once a month. I go into my football club once a week and I, I think of it as a preventative issue, a little problem that you can sort out from day one or week one doesn't fall into a much bigger problem. So I'm thinking prevention is better than cure. And I would say to the corporate world, just hire yourself some of these people, some of you guys who are coming through as psychotherapists, go in once a week, just run a clinic. And you know, I've, I've got a whole idea of, we think of psychotherapists as sitting in a room with somebody one-to-one. -one. I don't do that at the football club. I, I do some of it, but I'll go out on the training pitch as well and just say to somebody, you're all right. Oh, I haven't scored for three weeks, Gary, and I feel dreadful. Well, should we talk about it? You know, let's do something about it. Oh, I've got the boss is angry with me. I want, he wants me to sign a contract. Give me a call. There's lots of different ways of working. So you don't have to go into a workplace and sit in a, in a you know, into your clinic and, and just wait for somebody to come through the door. Just go have those coffee, coffee machine moments. Just be there saying something. How are you doing? How are you getting on? How's the promotion going? How's the new job going? And knowing the company, knowing the people who are changing jobs, the ones who are getting married, having kids or whatever. How's, how's the new family going? 
those are those relationships that then create, you know what, Gary, I'm having a tough time. Actually, it's, it's hard being a dad. Prevention, 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 prevention. PWPs. Okay. If any of you have any further questions, you can contact me through my Twitter handle. I'm on the counselling directory and on Booper and Cognacity and lots of different ways of contacting me. So please, if you have any questions about training, I could write a book about training, by the way. Um, I was saying to somebody right at the start, if I'd have known what I knew on day one, by the time I'd finished, I'd never have done my course. But um, um, any other questions before we, before we finish? I apologize profusely for the, the temperature. Sorry about that, my, my apologies. Not in my control, not way, way above my pay grade. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you for yeah, being such a lovely as the